than some of the main hustle. Okay. Uh, so I guess I don't need to introduce myself again. And um, this uh, presentation is about my work down here, and uh, also as a preview of some of the new features that will be available in the next release of MATLAB. So let's get on to it. Uh, well, thank you. So, uh, neural networks, without any doubt, has revolution, revolutionized so many domains in the, very, in, the, in the recent years, such as machine translation or autonomous driving. And recently, even for critical application domains, such as medicine, there is also the adoption of these deep learning based techniques. Here's a list of FDA's AI approvals, and this list is quickly expanding still. So we know that deep learning is great, but there's a problem to deep learning. Is training a deep learning neural networks is painful. And the reason for that is the model accuracy, which is your goal for this, uh, for this deep net. It depends on a bunch of things that are not so obviously connected, such as the model architecture, such as your model's configurations, known as the hyperparameters, and also your data sets. And the bad thing about this is, you, is there is no universal truth for choosing the points of this function. So everything has to be done in a trial and error basis. And to make this more concrete, let me give you an example. So before even training a deep neural network, you have to select the model architecture. Let's say you have four choices for the model architecture, and you have three other hyperparameters. Don't worry about what, what do they mean. You just need to know that they have some impact on your model's accuracy. And let's say you have four choices for each of them, and suddenly you have 256 different configurations to train, and each of them will cost you several hours, if not days. So training a deep net is never training just one deep net. It's exploring this uh, functional space for the best model. And so we are in dire need for speed because we have so many models to train. And the solution to that is, well, it's money. The most obvious solution is money. You, have, you, you buy more machines, you throw in more computational power, but then how do we utilize those machines? And that brings our motivation for good parallelism of uh, utilizing uh, these uh, computational resources. Is there someone asking questions? Can you mute, can you mute on mute on the phone, please? Yes. Okay. So here's the outline of this talk. So I will first uh, give you a brief introduction to the backgrounds and also the existing landscapes of all sorts of uh, distributed deep learning training. And then I will move on to this research project called Mother Harbor Parallelism, which I did back in uh, UC San Diego. And the third, but not the least, is the, uh, is the work I did uh, for, the last, uh, for, the, for this past summer, is how did we uh, implement Mother Harbor on GPDB and with uh, MATLAB. So the first thing, if the, so we have, I've just mentioned, we need to parallelize deep learning training. So before diving into how do we parallelize it, let's first have a look at how the training is done on just one machine. So this is one single node machine, uh, one single node training. This algorithm is called Minibatch SCD. This is the most popular uh, training algorithm for deep learning, uh, for deep neural networks. So on the left hand side, you have your data table. You have three columns of nine rows, and you have this machine learning model, this deep learning model. And it first visits one mini batch. In this case, uh, three rows we call a uh, mini batch. 
and this model visits them and updates itself based on something calculated from these uh, uh, from this data set uh, from these data points and multiplied by a hyperparameter called learning rate. So the thing is, it's updated now, and then it visits the next mini batch and it updates itself there and there until it reaches the end of your data table. This is what we call one iteration. It's the it's the process of this model visits all the data set, all the data points. And the typical machine learning training happens for tens of iterations, sometimes uh, hundreds of iterations. And this is called one mini batch. And as you noticed, in this example, this model visits this uh, data set in the sequential order. That is important to its performance. If it's not sequential, it, that, uh, it, no, it doesn't converge so fast. This is uh, something I will mention later. So let's, we have already seen how the training is done for one node. Let's recap on our question. So the question is we have a lot of model configurations. We have a lot of models to train and to find which one is the best. And we have some machines we just bought their dollars and uh, these machines the easiest uh, scenario here is these machines each one of them has the same full data set each one of them has the nine rows of the data set so any of these machine can be used to train any of these models basically and what do you do they well it's embarrassingly parallel it's just, a, it's just allocate one model to one machine and let them train and live it, them, live it, let it be and get the trained models in the end. This is, well, this is very easy, but there's a, there's a problem. You wasted storage here. This data set is duplicated across your cluster. And what if your data set doesn't fit in a single node's memory or even disk. Of course, you can mitigate that by having some common file system or even a central data repository attached to this cluster. But again, instead of wasting storage and memory, you're wasting network here. So this is not optimal. So we have seen task parallelism. Let's have a look at the other branch of the parallelism of Deep learning training. It's called data parallelism. So in this uh, branch of research, we still have our models. And instead of replicated uh, data, we have partition data. So each node has only one portion of your entire data set. So you can't throw this model there and let it run and get the results from the end and see that's, that's fully trained. So let's have a look at how this can be done. To make things easier, let's think about, let's first think about how to train just one model efficiently. Let's just train one model and put the rest in a queue. So for data parallelism, what happens is you broadcast this model to your entire cluster and each node gets a copy of that model and they train this model based on their local data partition. And they update them. And then these updates are collected back to your master node. And this master node updates the global model. Uh, and then, the, well, and this process goes on and on. This master then, dis uh, then dispatch this same model to the, to the entire uh, cluster. Again, and they update. So depending on how this is done, there are several variants. If you let this model to train on the entire data set, on the entire iteration, then you have box synchronous parallelism, also known as model averaging. This is introduced in the most recent uh, release of MATLAB. It has a, a problem of bad convergence behavior. I have no time to explain it here, but it's 
related to that sequential order I mentioned before. If we are doing this per iteration, if we are doing update only per iteration, then it's not equivalent to sequential SVD. So to mitigate that, you can do an update per mini-batch. If you do this, it's still equivalent to the sequential SVD. It gives you better uh, convergence behavior. And then you have synchronous parameter server. That's just a name. It's called parameter server and it's synchronous. And if you break this synchronization barrier, if these updates are pushed whenever they're ready, then you have a synchronous parameter server. Or you can get rid of this master node uh, directly and let them communicate with each other. Then you have decentralized uh, this stuff. And you have MPI or reduce, which is implemented in Horowell, which is a system uh, made by Uber. So all of these three systems, they have a same problem. They have high communication costs because they have to communicate per mini batch instead of per iteration. But this has bad convergence. So there are pros and cons. So now we have seen task parallelism. We have seen data parallelism. They have good things, they have bad things. So the natural thinking is, can we take out the good things from them and combine them together? And the answer is yes. And the result is this new granularity of parallelism we call model hopper parallelism. And let me introduce you to it. This is an ongoing uh, research. We are submitting a paper just recently. We have published a, a workshop paper already, but uh, yeah. So model hopper parallelism, the, the problem setting is the same. You have the models and you have partition data, just like data parallelism. And we allocate each model to each data partition, just like task par parallelism. And then we train these models on each data partition and update them. And this is training on the entire iteration, just like model averaging. And after that, is why it's called is the reason why it's called model hopper. We hop the the model to other uh, data partitions and train there, and we hop again until each model. So this model it has visited this, has visited this, it has visited this in sequential order, just like any other data parallelism with synchronous and, mini, uh, and per mini batch update. But we only communicate after each iteration. So we have all the good things from all the things I have, uh, I have talked about. So this is what we call one iteration because it's one model visiting the entire data set. But instead of one model visiting the entire data set, we have three models, they all visited the, the same data set in the same time. And that's called one sub park. So here's some uh, results published in a, in a workshop paper. So the, the takeaway here is uh, it's fantastic. You should use it. So, yeah. That's uh, well, I'm just kidding, but it, it can be your optimal choice. If you look at here, it's the, it's the fastest. And if you look at here, this is the lower, the better. It provides you the, one of the best convergence behavior. And that is uh, basically model hopper uh, parallelism. All right, so we have. Uh, excuse me. Oh, it's called Cerebro. This is the, the official name of that project. I see. Yes. Okay. And now is the is how do we incorporate this into MATLAB and let it work on GPDB. So there are several things we need to worry about. The first is scheduling. How do we decide the allocation of the tasks? How do we decide in which order do we hop the model? And the second is how do we actually do the model hopping? How do we devise a mechanism to dispatch the model to a specific uh, segment? And the third one is how do we, how do we run the training? And this is also important with don't want unnecessary data motion in between of them. So the scheduling part, 
this part, uh, for now, it's, uh, it's very easy. It's in a round and robin fashion. It's just like I showed you. And uh, there's really nothing to talk about this, but there's lots of space uh, left for this, um, uh, for this thing. But I won't talk about it. Uh, for now, it's just round robin. And the second thing is how do we dispatch the model to your data? So we have these models, we collect them into one table called model table. And we have our data, a data table. And we devise a, a utility to manually label these partitions with a distribution key. And we distribute based on this distrib distribution key. It's actually harder than, than just one to three serial numbers. We actually had to work around um, the unique way that GBDB does the, uh, the distribution. But anyway, so this distribution key is the label of the affinity of the models. So if it's two, it goes there. And we do a drawing in here and end up with the model and the nodes and the, the, and the, the training data co-located. And to do the training, we basically just select a UDA. This is UDA. Uh, which invokes a uh, Keras and with the TensorFlow backend. This is already there in the current uh, release. So you can just reuse it from this and group by this distribution key to make it to make this query targeted query and invoke no uh, data motion. And that's basically the implementation. Here's the uh, some new APIs introduced. So first thing is this uh, long name uh, function called load model selection table. This basically generates that model configurations. It does a grid search. So what you really care is these three hyperparameters. You give the choices for the hyperparameters. And in the end, it gives you this uh, model configuration. It gives you this table that contains all the, all the models. And with that, you can throw that to this, uh, this function called MetaPRS fit multiple model. As the name suggests, it takes in multiple models and train them all together with model helper parallelism. And the input, the output, and this model selection table is what you uh, generated before. And you pass in the number of iterations you want. And to that, in the end, it gives you the models trained, right? Because they are orange. And, uh, and last but not least, let me show you some preliminary tests on this thing. So we have uh, tested against the existing model averaging. We tested with 20 model configurations on the 20 segment uh, GBDB cluster. And we choose the best of these 20 configs and plot the things here. And it's, they're trained on this uh, data set called Cypher 10. It's a classic image data set. And as you can, as you can see here, model hop uh, converges. Oh, so on the left-hand side, this is the accuracy. So the best, uh, the, the better, uh, the higher, the better. And model hop uh, is way much better than model averaging. They can get to the to accuracy that this count. And the right hand side is the training loss. This is the, the lower, the better. And again, model hopper is uh, converging much faster. So a tiny uh, caveat here is because of the overheads, the actual overheads introduced by model hopping and the limits imposed by green plum, it currently works 30% slower end to end uh, comparing against to model averaging. But as an exchange, you get way much better uh, accuracy in the end. And that is what I have. Any questions? Yeah, on that point, could you, can, can you compare like, uh, accuracy versus uh, compute time? Uh, so the, the thing here is for, for this model, it's trained, well, for this model averaging, we can plot that, uh, we can plot that thing because it's actually trained. So the, the class is training only this one model and we have an accuracy. Uh, we have an accuracy versus time. 
But for this, it's actually training multiple models at the same time. So, so it might be that the first half bulk of time, this model wasn't even trained at all. And after some time, it's getting trained and, uh, uh, yeah, but we can, we can plot that. So if you, if you uh, realistically look at this, so this thing is 30% slower than this thing. So when it goes to the 20th uh, epoch, this thing is only at its, like, let's say 15th epoch. So it, it's like 80% of accuracy. This thing is like 55%, 60% of accuracy. So it's still better than that. Another thing to note is that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, yes. that the 30% slower with model averaging is model averaging is only running one model. And model hopping is 30% slower, but it's learning way more models. Uh, how many models are there in this example? Uh, 20 models for for model average for model averaging it's also running 20 20 models but uh, in a sequential order it's just train one model and then the next yes i have a feedback i really like your presentation when you mm -hmm. arranged it so that like at first we see like uh task parallelism and we're all like oh that sucks and then mm -hmm. by the time you present like data parallelism i think everyone in the audience already got a hint like oh wait if we can just stack them up and rotate them <laughs> And then, like, boom, like, you just actually introduce, like, the, the, the data mm -hmm. model model. So, like, I really like that presentation more. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, I, I, I think, did you, do you see a parallel between um, this and some more classic scheduling problems? Because this looks strikingly similar yes. to complex yes. research yes. when you have a processor yes. uh, running a sequential program. Yes. But there are like three interleaved independent things, but you yes, can just three yes. NPUs. Yes. Uh, so this thing, uh, in the formal setting, it's OpenShop. It has a name of uh, called OpenShop uh, scheduling problem. It's it's NP hard. So um, this thing, this round robin I showed you, I showed you here. It's the optimal solution if your mix spans of the of the tasks are identical. Otherwise, it's Otherwise, it's not, uh, yes. Well, so, even in OpenShop, when you have equivalent, uh, identical uh, mm -hmm. intervals, are they still in here? Because uh, like that hardness comes from the, the jagged. Yeah, if, if you have uh, if you have identical mix bands, then it's, uh, well, the problem is itself is still in PR, but but this problem, is, but this thing is it's the optimal solution to that. Yeah. So, uh, a question for the phone, if if you can hear. Yes. Yep. So, um, if you so normally, like, if you're training on a single node and you go through, uh, my understanding is that you would, uh, people would typically. Um, you know, reshuffle the the order of the records. Uh, you know, and re you know, like have a different sets of an order of mini batches. Yes. yes exactly. um, but in this case, because you're wanting to minimize data movement, presumably you're not doing that. And so, you know, is there, you know, yes. what concerns do you have around that? Yes. Yes. Exactly. So the the common belief is you have to reshuffle the data every iteration, but it's actually not needed because the sequential SGD it's robust enough to the uh, visiting order of the data. So the, the thing here is you have to shuffle this data at the very beginning. You have to shuffle it before uh, you partition it. But after that, you actually don't need to, to shuffle the data again. Just so one even, shuffle is suffice, yes. So, so even within the same um, sub epoch or whatever you call it, like do, do you, uh, do you shuffle within this, the, the partition between iterations? Nope, nope. It's, uh, it's actually not needed. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting, thanks. Yes. <clears throat> One other thing on that, Scott, is we tried, um, we tried reshuffling with model averaging between iterations, and it was the same thing. We, I was surprised that um, even if you shuffle between iterations on model averaging, it didn't improve convergence at all. So it seems like shuffle once up front is sufficient. Very interesting. Thank yes. you. Yes. So this this is actually a property of uh, 
of SGD that we are exploiting, uh, which is its robustness to the uh, to the visiting order and the randomness of the of the data order. But 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 again, it's it's very vital. You have to shuffle it at the very beginning. So the question with the result um, that you showed at the very last slide. So you're yes. comparing Hopper to the model averaging. Yep. And so in model Hopper, you've got n number of models that you're changing, you know, you're mm -hmm. evaluating over. So yes. is this picking the best model yes. of the 20 or the average of the 20 models? It's the best of 20. So this one is the best of 20 models that model Hopper trained. So this is one of the uh, this is the best model of the 20 models that model averaging trained. Okay. Oh, well, they are the same configurations. That's why they selected the, the very best behavior. And, but because this is uh, in reality what you really want, because those 20 segment, uh, those 20 models, they are semantically equivalent. You just want the best one. Once you train those 20 models, how do you choose which one is? Like yeah, model. yeah. Based on this, uh, on this accuracy, this is the metric that you. It's manual right now. We don't have an automated. Yeah, it's not automated. So they decide this will train these models, and then have to do something to figure out which one to use. Right. Yeah, but but uh, well, ideally, this metric that you, which is user provided, should reflect the 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 uh, the desiderata of this model. So the higher the better. So just select the the one that has the best the best uh, training accuracy in the end of the the training. Yeah. Do, you have, oh, do, you, do you ever not? Do you ever care about any of the other models that are not the best? Uh, well, I can't think of a, a scenario for that. Uh, yeah, because this is this is well. Well, it's called model selection because it, you want the the best model, right? What is stupid question? What does model averaging mean? It, it means you add those models together and average them. So the model has a yes. But that, that sentence itself assumes that you can represent all these models with the same vector size. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Because the the well because. So model averaging, you're training the, the same model. Uh, you're training the one, the, the same model on all of these uh, segments. Oh, it's not here. I, I missed that. Yeah. I was like, well, you can have yeah. different models. Yeah, for different models, you can yeah. average them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You train 20 different models. Do they all take the same time to train, or do you see some variables uh, For this test, for this test, uh, the variance is very low because we didn't vary the the model architecture, and we changed the mini batch size. But that uh, seems not to uh, matter with the mix bands too much. But in reality, the variance of this uh, of this mix of these tasks can be uh, can be big. Yes. Another case in which may we agree on. <clears throat> Because it has a sync hard synchronous barrier, it may not be the most efficient. So, I mean, the yeah. kind of thing yeah. this might be try to keep your mix bands like roughly the same. Yes, try just to keep them all complexity roughly the same, right? Yes, just like Jesse's uh, questions. So this thing here, this one is the uh, synchronization barriers. So if this mix bands that are different, then the the total time spent on this uh, this entire task will be equal to the biggest model, and it's always equal to the biggest model, which is uh, which is the worst case scenario, which is as as bad as it can be. Yes. Hi. Yes. How does TensorFlow um, utilize GPUs? And the reason I'm asking this is because mm -hmm. so far we've been doing the visual that like every segment host mm -hmm. is like one shot in the open shot model. Mm -hmm. Yes. But like. That does test, if you have multiple GPUs, does TensorFlow just use all of them or use only one? And will, will you consider the alternative where you model each GPU mm -hmm. as an open shop? Yeah, uh, for now, we just assign uh, one, one GPU to one shop. So for TensorFlow, if you provide it with multiple GPUs, you can 
you can use that, but you have to manually uh, configure your model to make it uh, running in parallel on those uh, on those GPUs. Otherwise, it will allocate everything on the on the on whatever the first GPU it found. And if that goes out of memory, it goes to the next GPU. Also, That's just one. Sounds like TensorFlow in the default version uses one GPU, right? So when when your host has more than more GPUs, mm -hmm. this complicates the model because now you have, you know, one segment with the same. Shot oh yes. Yeah. yeah. So 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 um, our host, if it has, so we have we always have the same number of segments to the same number of GPUs. Yes. Actually, we don't have to have one to one. You can have less GPUs. So more GPUs do not help, but you can have less GPUs also. So the you GPUs get shared. You can have. You don't need the. If you have four segments on a host. You can use two GPUs, and those two GPUs will be shared among the four segments. Oh. But if you have more, we do not utilize all of them. So if you have five GPUs and four segments, you will still only use four GPUs, and one will be hybrid. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.